Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about air. Topic for the day is going to be ozone and indoor air pollution, two separate things, but we're going to lump them together into the same video. So as always, a couple objectives to get going, and then we'll jump on in. So here's what I need you to know by the end of this video. Be able to describe the formation of ozone, discuss the role of CFCs in the destruction of the ozone layer, and describe various types of indoor air pollution. So that's what we got. As I always say, let's jump on in. So first thing for the day is going to be UV radiation. Before we talk about ozone, ozone destruction, all that good stuff, you need to know a little bit about UV radiation. So the sun sends out uh, radiation of all wavelengths. You have got low, ra low energy infrared radiation that provides us with heat. You got mid energy uh, radiation, which is the visible light that we see, and then you've got high energy UV radiation. Now, that UV radiation comes in three types you've got UVA, UVB, and UVC. Each one has a different energy level, and UVB and UVA are the ones that cause skin cancer and skin damage. So, keep that in your brain as we move on forward. All of these UV radiations can cause damage to living organisms on the surface of the earth. UVA, UVB are the big ones that we are concerned with. So now that we've talked about UV radiation, let's talk about stratospheric ozone. So in previous videos in this unit, I've talked about tropospheric ozone or ground level ozone. That is still O3 gas. Ozone is O3 gas, whether it's in the troposphere or the stratosphere. When it's down at ground level, it is a respiratory tract irritant. It impacts people who have asthma and it can harm plants. So ground level ozone, not good. However, when it is up in the stratosphere, it is our sunscreen, meaning that the ozone in the stratosphere absorbs UV radiation so that it does not make it down into the surface of the Earth. Now, if we were in basic Earth science, you just need to know that and you'd be good to go. But since this is apes, we got to talk about how ozone actually absorbs those types of UV radiation protecting us from them. So here's how it goes. We need to talk about a cycle first before we can talk about the actual absorption of it. So Here's how we go. Um, you basically have a three-step process. So in the first step, you have got O2 gas. That would be the gas that we breathe, which is naturally occurring you know, through photosynthesis. You got O2 gas interacting with UVC radiation. So that UVC radiation strikes the O2 molecule and breaks it into two oxygen molecules. So essentially what you go from is two oxygen molecules that are bonded to one another. That UVC radiation hits it breaks that bond, <laughs> looks like a little face, um, breaks that bond and you end up with two separate oxygen molecules. So that is step number one. In step number two, an O2 molecule hooks up with one of these free oxygen molecules. So you got an O2 hanging out, let's say it just jumped out of a plant from photosynthesis. This O2 molecule hooks up with one of our free oxygens that was just created and you have O3 gas, also known as ozone. This O3 gas can be struck by either UVB or UVC light. When it is struck by that radiation, it takes that O3 and it breaks it down into O2 and oxygen again. When this light strikes that ozone, it is absorbed so that it does not make it down to the surface of the Earth. So if you notice, this is a whole cycle that bounces between the formation of O2, the breakdown of O2, the formation of O3, the breakdown of O3. This cycle ensures that we have got the ozone that we need in the atmosphere, but it also ensures that we have got the oxygen gas that we need to breathe. So make sure that you understand the cycle and how the cycle leads to the absorption of UVB and UVC radiation, as I said right here. Um, important thing to note is that ozone is the only molecule that absorbs UVC radiation. Now, there are these chemicals known as CFCs. CFCs are terrible. Well, they're good or they're bad. So as far as why they're created and why they're used, um, they are chlorine-containing organic compounds. They're used as propellants and refrigerants. So they were used to keep things cool. They were used in air conditioners, refrigerators, things like that. They were also used in aerosol cans, so spray paint, deodorant, things like that. Um, they are highly stable. They are inert. As far as humans are concerned, they don't do any damage to us. But because they are so stable, once they're released into the atmosphere, they can stay there for a really long time. By a really long time, I mean anywhere between 10 and 100 years. Once they're into the atmosphere, they cause other problems. So uh, CFCs are generally pretty big molecules, 
Once they're into the atmosphere, sunlight hits them. When the sunlight hits them, it breaks off a chlorine molecule. So the CFCs get into the atmosphere, a chlorine molecule is broken off. Once that chlorine molecule is broken off, it can start running around doing some damage. And here's basically what that chlorine does. We see here our ozone gas that was formed in that cycle we talked about on the last slide. Got your ozone gas that interacts with chlorine and chlorine rips off one of the oxygens. When it rips off one of the oxygens, this chlorine monoxide is formed and an O2 molecule is left over. So we have now broken apart our ozone, but we didn't absorb any UV radiation when doing so. We just broke it up and we didn't save any or uh, stop any UV radiation from coming in. That chlorine monoxide <clears throat> can then give its oxygen back over to another free oxygen that's floating around, giving us O2 gas. And this chlorine, if you notice, is now free to go around and do this whole cycle again. So this process right here leads to the conversion from O3 to oxygen and O2. So we are taking ozone out of the atmosphere, but we're not absorbing any UV radiation while we're doing it. That chlorine molecule can just keep cycling around and around and around. It's a catalyst, which means it makes the reaction happen without being used up. Uh, one CFC molecule can break down 100,000 ozone molecules. Stat to keep in your brain. Also, this is going to lead to the ozone destruction without UV absorption. So this is why people talk about CFCs as being a really bad thing. And then those CFCs can lead to the ozone layer, so in the or a hole in the ozone layer. So in the early 1980s, scientists began to realize that over the Arctic and the Antarctic, every year a really big hole would form in the ozone layer. And what this means is that a whole bunch of ozone would disappear, so that the layer of ozone would get really thin in that area. Now, globally, ozone concentrations have also been shown to be severely decreased since the 1980s, but everybody talks about the ozone hole, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, it happens seasonally, and it's a pretty complex process, but basically what you need to know about it is, if you remember, the formation of ozone requires sunlight. Problem is, through the winter in the, Anti in the Arctic and the Antarctic, the sun doesn't come out, so you've got a three-month period where the sun is not shining, which means that ozone is not being formed. The other thing that happens during the winter is during the winter in the atmosphere chlorine molecules uh, collect so you get all these Cl2 molecules collecting in the atmosphere during the winter. Now they're not that big of a problem because at that point they're Cl2 molecules and they aren't going to mess with the ozone but in the springtime when the sun starts to come out again the sun strikes those chlorine molecules takes each one of those Cl2s, breaks them up into individual chlorine molecules and they start zipping around breaking down the ozone layer problem is the ozone layer is already thin at that point because you haven't had sunlight through the winter to build more ozone. So in the first parts of the spring, you get this huge breakdown of ozone because that chlorine is free to zip around and it's not being formed as quickly because the sun is just starting to come out. Reduction in ozone layers has been shown to have impact on many things. Um, it impacts plants. It damages many of their structures and their cells. It also decreases the amount of photosynthesis they can carry out. For amphibians, Unfortunately, amphibians' eggs don't have shells around them, so uh, extra UV radiation can severely impact the eggs of amphibians and the embryos that are in those eggs. And then for humans, it can lead to damage of eyes. It can also lead to increased rates of skin cancer. Now, obviously, this is a big problem that people wanted to do something about. And funny enough, people actually got something done. When it comes to environmental stuff, a lot of times there's wrangling and nothing actually happens. Montreal Protocol was something that actually happened. Um, it initially started out with just a few nations that agreed to ban CFCs, but it since has become a global agreement, like 180 countries are signed on to it, and they have agreed not to use ozone-depleting chemicals. So Montreal Protocol, ozone-depleting chemicals, a lot of countries are in on it. So problem is it's going to take a while for CFC concentrations to stabilize because there are still products out there that use CFCs. And like I said, CFCs stay in the environment for a really long time. So the expectation is that somewhere around 2100, uh, the concentration of CFCs in the atmosphere will start going down such that the ozone layer can actually recover. Now, we're going to switch gears here. And we're going to wrap up with indoor air pollution, just a little tag on to the end. Indoor air pollution is pollution inside of a building easy enough. 
Um, I want to talk about it first in the developing world. Now, in the developing world, it's different than the developed world. Um, biggest problem with indoor air pollution in the developing world is that a lot of times people have to do cooking within their house over some sort of open fire. So some stats for you. Around the world, every year, 1.6 million people die as a result of indoor air pollution. 90% of those people are in the developing world, and 56% of those people are under the age of five. So cooking over these manure or wood fires that put out a ton of carbon monoxide and that release a ton of particulate matter are killing a lot of people around the world every year. And so there's a big push to get um, efficient cooking stoves to people in the developing world in the hopes of reducing this problem. Now, in the developed world, our mix of indoor air pollution is a little bit different. I'm just going to kind of go around this graph here to point out some things that you need to be aware of. We're going to start down in the basement. So in these houses, in many parts of the country, the rocks and the soil that surround the basement of the house have got rocks in them that release radon. Radon is a radioactive gas that has been linked to lung cancer. So basement, rocks, decaying, releasing radon gas can lead to cancer. That would be one type of indoor air pollution. We're then going to move up and we've got floor, we've got ceiling tiles, we've got pipe insulation, and we have got just general insulation in older buildings contain asbestos. Asbestos is a fibrous material that when breathed in causes mesothelioma and other types of lung cancer. Again, in older houses, you have got lead paint. When that lead paint flakes off and is breathed in or eaten by small children. It's a neurotoxin that can cause neurological damage. You got tobacco smoke. We've all heard of the dangers of tobacco smoke. There are tons of carcinogenic compounds in that tobacco smoke that over time can cause cancer. Furniture, foam insulation, pressed wood, and other processed materials have got VOCs that, as we said previously, can contribute to the formation of ozone and smog, but they can also be a respiratory irritant and lead to just a general feeling of nausea. You also have got pesticides, plants, cleaning fluids with VOCs in them. You've got fireplaces and wood stoves, which could put out particulate matter if the wood is burning improperly or not fully. And then finally down here, if you've got a leaky or unvented gas, furnace, wood stove, car in the garage, water heater, anything that burns something, you can get carbon monoxide, which we talked about as being a silent killer because it kills by messing up your body's ability to bind oxygen. So make sure that you take a look around this graph and understand the different types of indoor air pollution that people in the developed world are subjected to. Final slide for the day talks about sick building syndrome. Sick building syndrome occurs in the construction of new buildings. So all of those materials they, they use to build new buildings from the carpet to the furniture to the wood to the ceiling tiles, they all give off VOCs. Problem is new buildings are built to be energy efficient, which means that they are well sealed. So if you've got this building that's well sealed, all those VOCs get trapped inside. And so people working in that building can actually be made ill from all of the VOCs that are present in that building. Also, Sometimes if the building is poorly ventilated, you can get mold problems, which can also contribute to declining health of the people in that building. So sick building syndrome is a situation where the actual environment of a building, usually a newly constructed building, makes the people who work there ill. And that's it for the day. Make sure that you go back and review the major ideas in this video. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.